Welcome. I'm Pastor Kent King Nobles, and this is the worship service for the faith community of the First United Methodist Church of Normal, Illinois. I'm glad you're here to worship. We're going to celebrate several things in today's service. One of the things that we get to celebrate is giving our Bibles to third graders. This is something we do every year and we have on, on film to participate in today, uh, uh, giving Bibles to two of our third graders. So I'm looking forward to that. We're also going to have a rhythmic call to worship. This is something uh, Jan has been working with, uh, with some of you on. So I'm looking forward to seeing how this comes out in the service. And we're going to talk about two sisters that got into a little bit of a fight when Jesus was there. And we're going to talk about how Jesus responded to them. We're going to talk about one of the lessons of this pandemic is that we need people, that we need relationships. So we'll explore that a little bit. I'm glad you're here for worship. Let's make time and make space in our lives and in our hearts to worship God.
Come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, everybody. Everybody needs you. Come on, everybody. Let's praise, 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 praise the Lord. Come on, everybody. Everybody needs you. Come on, everybody. Let's praise, 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 praise the Lord. Who's going to praise the Lord today? I'm going to praise the Lord today with my whole heart. With my whole mind, with my whole self, with all the strength that I have. Who's going to praise the Lord today? I'm going to praise the Lord today. In front of friends, in front of family, in front of preachers and Sunday school teachers. Now everybody praise the Lord. Let everybody praise our Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Olivia and Raleigh. I'm, I'm feeling like my eyes are getting hot. Okay, so receive this gift of this Bible so that the story of God and God's people may be with you at home, at church, or wherever you shall choose to carry it. Enjoy reading how God is at work in nature and in history. Learn about the life and teachings of Jesus. Be open to how God may continue to speak to you through your reading of the scriptures. Okay. So parents, I got a couple questions for you. Parents, you can just say, we will. Will you model love for God's word before your child? Will you accept responsibility as your child's primary faith influencer to impress the truth of love and love of God's word as you live life together? Yeah, okay, congregation, you ready for yours? You can answer, we will. Congregation, will you partner with these parents 
by praying for them as they lead their child's spirituality. And will you partner with these families by teaching and modeling a Christ-like faith? Louder, please. Yeah. yeah, that's more like it. Okay, so your Bibles are officially presented to you, and they're yours to write in, put stickers in. Yes, Olivia, you can, you can write in your very own Bible. I do all the time. It's yours to keep. And now Kathy's going to uh, lead us in a, in a special prayer. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your Holy Scripture that continues to change us and guide us and lead us. Thank you for Olivia and Raleigh, for their lives and the ways that you are already at work in their lives. And may the Holy Bible, may the words that they read, give them strength and give them hope and always remind them that they are your beloved child. Thank you, O oh God. Amen. with you today. I am so thrilled that you joined us. All month of August, we have been discovering how creative God is and how God made us just as creative. Now, creativity is imagining what you could do because you are made in the image of God. And last week, we talked about how Jesus was teaching and preaching and and showing all these amazing miracles to the people. And as we know, whenever Jesus decided to, to talk or to, to perform a miracle, crowds would gather. And one particular day, crowds began to gather around Jesus because they wanted to hear what he had to say. So he went up into, onto this mountainside and he decided to teach the people something really important. And it comes from the book of Matthew. So the disciples joined in and Jesus began to teach his disciples and the crowd that was starting to gather. Listen to what Jesus has to say in Matthew 5, 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its saltiness, how will it become salty again? Hmm, interesting, salt. We use salt for a lot of different things. It's pretty easy to get. Um, it's not very expensive. We use it to season our foods mostly, right? I like it on my scrambled eggs and I like to put a little on my popcorn. Back then though, salt was really, really valuable and it was hard to come by and it was really expensive. Sometimes they even paid the Roman soldiers in salt. Um, and it wasn't used just to season food. It was used to preserve meat. They even needed to use salt to make the very expensive and royal purple dye. Um, and only the kings and queens got to wear the purple fabrics. Um, so yeah, salt was really valuable back then. So what does salt have to do with us? Well, for one, we are valuable right? And we are called to make the world a little bit better. Just like adding salt to our popcorn or salt to some of our foods makes it better. So God is asking us to be salty. I love that. So next time somebody says you're being salty, say thanks. That's what I'm called to do. I love that. But Jesus wasn't done there. He went on to say something else really important. Okay, let's go on. We're still in Matthew 5. He also went on to say, You are the light of the world. 
A city on top of a hill can't be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Hmm, what does that mean? Okay, so we know that there is darkness. Oh, but Jesus calls us to be the light of the world. And what does that mean? That means God wants us to shine light in the darkness, which means to, through our actions and, and through our words, we are to help others who might be living in the dark, who might be going through a dark time. And, and when we use our creativity, kids, the creativity that God gave us because we're made in God's image, we can help others, not through just our words, but through our actions. So kids, I want you to think about how you can be the salt of the earth and the light to others using your creativity. Because with that, you can change the world. I love you and I miss you. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye. Today's scripture reading is from Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Now as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. May God bless the reading, hearing, and living of these words. Have you ever had that feeling that you're the one doing all the work? I mean, did you ever have a brother or sister? And did you ever say to your mom, Mom, they're not doing their share? Whether at home or work, most of us have felt at one time or another that we were carrying more than our share of the load. And if you've ever felt that way, then you could probably relate to Martha. Jesus had come to their home. How exciting, Jesus coming to visit. So what do you do when a special guest is coming to visit you in your home? Well, usually you clean up a little bit, right? And you cook. You want this special person to have a special meal as a sign of your love or respect for them. So what's the problem? The problem is that sister, isn't it? Mary is enjoying sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to what Jesus is saying. And can't you just feel Martha's resentment coming all the way from the kitchen? She would probably be, enjoy sitting at the feet of Jesus and talking. Doesn't Jesus care that she's doing all this work and Mary, her sister, is not helping her? I mean, I can imagine as Martha is standing over a hot stove that her temper begins to overheat also. And as she hears the laughter coming from the other room, I can imagine the thoughts just begin to, to boil over in her mind until she has to come out of the kitchen and say something. So Martha complains to Jesus. Remember what she says? This is how we sometimes complain, isn't it? Instead of going and talking to her sister Mary, she comes and she talks to Jesus. And what does she say? Basically, she says, Jesus, I want you to shame my sister into doing what I want her to do. Martha tries to shame her sister into doing what she thinks is right. Now, frustrating to us triangulators, Jesus refuses to play this game. Jesus talks not to Mary. Jesus talks to Martha. Martha comes to him, and he engages in a relationship and talks with Martha. And what does he say to Martha? He says those words, Martha, Martha. You are distracted and worried about so many things. Distracted and worried about so many things. Only one thing is necessary. Now, I guess I don't have to tell you, this is not exactly the result that Martha is looking for. And if you're a bit frustrated with this story when you hear it, you're not alone. 
We know what's supposed to happen. Mary is supposed to get clobbered, shamed, put in her place. Martha is supposed to be praised for being such a good girl. Or at the very least, Jesus is supposed to have that exasperated roll of the eyes and say, come on, Mary, do what you're supposed to do. Mary is finally supposed to, supposed to be put to work. And Martha, Martha is finally supposed to be praised. She's supposed to finally get what she wants. I mean, doesn't Jesus care about the hardworking people of the world like Martha? Doesn't he want to bring just a little bit of judgment to the slackers like Mary? And just a little bit of help to those of us who are doing more than our share of the work? Is there anyone else besides me who would feel just a little bit happy if Jesus chastised Mary at least a small bit here? So what's really going on? You know, I think we tend to make this story about personality types. You know, may, can we be too type A personality, too, too much task-oriented personality? Or, or we make it about, is it better to be extroverted or introverted? But I think what this story is really all about is priorities. There's nothing wrong with work. Work can be a blessing. Work is a blessing. And besides, we all know that if no one ever goes into the kitchen and fixes a meal, soon there's going to be a lot of trouble. It's about priorities. There's a time for tasks and to-do lists, but there's also a time to sit at the feet of Jesus. And just between you and me, I'm guessing that we don't do this often enough. There's a time to focus on work and getting ahead, but there's also a time to focus on relationships on the people around us. So you and I are followers of Jesus Christ. When we look at the Gospels, we see who Jesus is. So what example does Jesus give us for who we should be? Well, Jesus was a carpenter. When we look at the Gospels, we see that Jesus was not afraid of work. Jesus was not afraid of sacrifice. But we also notice what Jesus always had time for people. Think about the stories you know of Jesus. Parents brought their children to Jesus, remember? And the disciples, what do the disciples say? The disciples got on to the parents. Jesus is much too important. Jesus doesn't have time for this, for these little children. Jesus is the Messiah. But what did Jesus do? He stopped the disciples and he said, no, bring the children to me. He saw the children and he blessed the children. He had time to relate to the children and the parents. How many times was Jesus interrupted in this way? Remember, he was going to save the young daughter of Jairus, Jairus who was a leader in the synagogue. And on the way, a hemorrhaging woman touched his garment. And on the way to save this child, Jesus stops. And he turns and he finds this woman, this bent-over woman, and he sees her. And he heals her and he blesses her. Remember blind Bartimaeus, just outside of the city of Jericho. Jesus is, is, is passing through the town, and all the dignitaries and all the important people are there. The disciples are there. And blind Bartimaeus calls out, Jesus, save me, heal me. And of course, for the people there, this is an embarrassment. They tell Bartimaeus, be quiet, you know, don't, don't cause trouble. But Jesus hears him. And Jesus stops this parade. And Jesus calls Bartimaeus to come and and be in the middle of the parade, to be in the middle of all these people. And Jesus sees him and talks with him. And he offers him the healing that Bartimaeus needs. The Samaritan woman, who Jesus was not supposed to talk to because she was a woman and because she was of a different racial group, ethnic group. But there she was at the well, and there Jesus was. So what did he do? He looked into her life, and he saw who she really was, and he offered her what she needed, living water to find God. The story about the Good Samaritan, what's that about? It's about being the right kind of neighbor, the one who stops when you come across someone in trouble, not crossing to walk by on the other side, but seeing a human being and seeing their need and seeing them as a child of God. I want to suggest to you that Jesus had very deep, real, authentic relationships. And if we are followers of Jesus, 
we are to have very real, deep relationships also. So how do we do this? You know, sometimes when I'm feeling a little bit closed in or, or feeling a bit weighed down by the world, I look for a lighthearted book of stories to read. Usually short stories that, you know, don't take me very long to read, don't make me think too much, but give me a better perspective on life. I hope you have habits that kind of help you get into a better perspective too. Kind of an antidote to all the bad news that we get. Watching the news, the political con conventions, all the scandals, too much of that, you know, it can drive a person crazy. So recently, I've been reading stories from Philip Gully been rereading the stories from Front Porch Tales. Philip Gully is a, is a pastor, Quaker pastor over in Indiana, and he writes these little stories that are, are just kind of lighthearted, but they're about people. They're kind of folksy. And, and one of the stories I read recently was about Philip Gully being a, a delivering newspapers in his hometown when he was just a boy. In the story, he talks about how he delivered newspapers to his 26 customers, for $7 a week. And he mentions that he had a friend, Bill Eddy, who delivered to over 80 customers and got three times the money. But he also noticed that Bill Eddy had three times the headaches that he had. With only 26 customers, Philip could take his time. He could stop and talk with some of the customers each day. He got to know them as he handed them their newspaper. And he has some funny tales about these eccentric people that he delivered to in his town growing up. But he also lets you know that he learned a lot about life from visiting with these people. He says it this way on page 37 of his book, Front Porch Tales. He says, if I had 80 customers, I would never have gotten to know all these people and their idiosyncrasies. I would have been consigned to a bicycle, flinging papers at porches as I whiz by. Instead, I climbed off my bike and shook hands and learned of a wider world. It established a pattern for living which I tried diligently to maintain, that bigger isn't always better. More money means more worries, and knowing people beats knowing about them. You know, this story reminds me of a time that I was in Mexico, staying with a poor family for a few weeks. It was a, a summertime when I was in college. And, and I noticed this pattern every evening. Every, all the people there came out of their little houses, and they went to the town plaza, you know, the center in the, in the middle of the town, in the, the park that was there. And they spent a couple hours every evening out there. The older people would talk and swap stories and talk about old times. Uh, some people would play chess or, or play games. The young kids would be running around, you know, uh, chasing each other and having fun. The, the teenagers would be flirting and, and looking at each other across the way. Of course, in those houses, they didn't have air conditioning and they didn't have television. So there was a good reason why everybody went outdoors. But what I found even in those that the two or three weeks that I was there is that those people had strong relationships. Those people had connections. There was something about investing those two hours every evening, being together at the end of the day, that built a community. Now, I'm not volunteering to give up my air conditioning, but I do wonder at times if there are ways that I need to restructure my life to build in more time for developing relationships, to make relationships more of a priority in my life. You know, we are good people, but some of us need to restructure our lives so that we have time to build those relationships, to access those relationships. People in our community need our relationships. People in our community are dying of loneliness. People are needing encouraging words and support, needing our smiles. Our neighbors need our relationships. You don't have to go knocking door to door. It's just a matter of being open to the people that God puts in our path each day. And whether we like to admit it or not, we need people. At least some close relationships in our lives. So how do you get there? I do believe that many of us need to consider some structural changes in our lives so that our lives are more about relationships and less about to-do lists and tasks and, and having nice houses and getting ahead at work. This COVID-19 this COVID is a real tragedy for so many people. 
and it's a real pain for all of us. If we are open, though, it will also teach us some important lessons. One of the lessons I think we should learn from this pandemic is that we need people. We need relationships. So how could you better prioritize people in your life? If you're willing, I'd like to leave you with these four questions for reflection. Maybe you could give a little time to reflecting on each of these questions today or this week. The first question, what relationships in your life are life-giving to you now? What relationships are life-giving to you? Number two, what can you do to make a greater investment in one relationship? In at least one relationship, what can you do to make a greater investment? Number three, who could benefit from relating to you more often or in a deeper way? Who could benefit from that? And number four, what one action are you willing to take this week? What one thing are you willing to do for relationship? May God bless your discernments. Amen. My name is Erica Cheeseman. I am the Congregational Care Coordinator. The past few months have made us more aware of the importance of reaching out. The easiest way you can reach out is to give yourself. By this, I mean make a phone call, send an email, write a card. If you're comfortable with it, pay someone a face-to-face -face visit, social distancing style, of course. By prioritizing people, and reaching out, we are making connections, building relationships, and letting others know that we care and that they are not alone. As we pause in this moment to join together in prayer, I'd like to ask you to hold the Imkey family in your prayers as, as Josh died this week. So we'll hold Josh's parents, Mark and Lori, and Josh's brother Andrew and sister Rachel in our prayers. We'll also remember those who have perhaps been affected by storms in, in the South. Um, as we're preparing this service, not sure how all of that is going to play out, but knowing that there will be those who are impacted, I invite you to continue to pray for them. Let's go before God now in prayer. Almighty God, you have created all people and all of creation in a diverse and complex way. And we give thanks for this gift that we are invited to engage with hope, joy, and love as your disciples. We give you thanks for the people that you have placed in our lives and that you know our relationships inside and out. You know that we have people in our lives that we love, people that we may tolerate, people that we're not sure that we can stand, and yet you give us patience 
and you remind us that we need one another. God, we ask that you would help us to find courage to sit and hear others when so often we want to be heard first. We ask that you will open our hearts and our eyes to see our communities as you would have us see them. And let us see all people as your children. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We continue to be thankful for the ways that, that we have continued to give each week. The ways that we are able to be a witness for our community, for the nation, and for the world. Our prayer is that this congregation will be a witness by being immersed in scripture, by being constant in prayer, joyful in worship, and generous in giving. And that we will be a loving, supportive community reaching out to those in need. What I believe is unique about YWCA is we offer a wide variety of services to the community. A lot of people may know us for our childcare, but we have a lot of other different unique programming that serves McLean County that not a lot of other places offer. The services that YWCA offers are early learning child care programming as well as before and after school programming and also summer camps. We also have our prevention and empowerment services and that includes programs such as Labyrinth and Stepping Stones. They're not siloed programs, they're all connected in a way. So YWCA really addresses needs in our community for all of McLean County that just come full circle. Stepping Stones is McLean County's only rape crisis center. We provide 24-hour support to sexual assault survivors and their loved ones through counseling, and that can be individual counseling, couples counseling, family counseling. We also have support groups. Uh, and then we also provide medical and legal advocacy. Through our prevention education, we do go to other schools in the community. We will work with kiddos as young as three and talk to them about safety in your community, what to do if you get lost, anti-bullying curriculum. We will also talk to them about good touch, bad touch, uncomfortable touch. And then as they get older, you know, as it progresses through high school, we might, that's when we might start talking about healthy relationships, what is consent. And we also will go through to the colleges and start talking about what rape culture is. We can best support, as a community, survivors of sexual assault in Stepping Stones in a lot of different ways. A huge way would be to switch the dialogue um, and to stop the victim blaming. When a victim is assaulted, a lot of times they decide they don't want to report it and that your control has been taken from you. And so our job is to restore that control by letting them know what their options are. You can just walk in here and you will see somebody within a couple minutes. 24 hours a day you can call someone and you will get someone to talk to. Free, no questions asked. We have a huge uh, responsibility and we have a huge ability to help survivors by just saying, I believe you and how can I help? Counseling is really important for all traumas, but particularly for sexual assault, particularly group counseling. I found so much healing to be done just by other people finding their voice. We, we always say that we're, we're here to hold your hand literally and figuratively, and we truly mean that. 
Labyrinth is a program at YWCA that helps formerly incarcerated women reintegrate back into our community where the women can come and they can learn different skills to go into the workforce. Really, Labyrinth is here to help build their confidence so that they know that they can do that. My name is Heather Canyon and I've been a client and a volunteer and a just grateful part of Labyrinth organization for the past three years. I utilized a lot of their services for my networking capabilities. I do own a salon here in town now and with a lot of hard work and with the networking tools that I've been able to utilize through Labyrinth, none of that would have been possible. Unfortunately, I was the last female offender to give birth cuffed to a bed in the state of Illinois. I learned how to be a mother and things like that in um, prison. And I knew that in order to change, I needed to change myself. And that meant not going back to that community. Everybody has to help themselves, but you have to want it. So Labyrinth has given me all the tools physically that I need to be successful. One of the biggest pieces of the Labyrinth program is our transitional housing, and that is where we house up to eight women for two years. If you're constantly operating in crisis mode, then you can't actually start to focus and fix on your trauma. Once we really start to see the change in the women, you start to see their smile again. You start to see them start to believe actually in themselves again. Helping a community outreach like Labyrinth helps everybody in your community because you're giving somebody a chance. You're giving a mother a chance, you're giving a daughter a chance, you're giving them a chance to be successful, to get a job, to put food on the table. You're giving them a chance. You know, working in both Stepping Stones and Labyrinth mean a lot to me and make me feel like I'm a better person and that I'm making a difference, but also that it's not just about me. These people are vulnerable and they deserve to be loved and they deserve to be believed and supported. And once the community gets on board and starts to believe that too, then I think McLean County can be a completely different place. And it really can become one community that loves one another and supports one another. Our closing hymn is They'll Know We Are Christians by Our Love.
I miss worshiping with you in person, but it is good that at least we can worship together online. It is important to continue to stay connected in faith to God and to each other. So as we go through this week, I hope you have a good week. I hope it's a meaningful week. If there's anything you need, let us know. The church is is always here to help. So in this week, may we also make time to sit at the feet of Jesus. And may we also reflect on how we can develop our relationships with our neighbors. God bless you. Amen.